section 1.5, analyzing graphs of functions. Motivation is what gets you started. Habit is what keeps you going. Jim Rowan. So first, let's look at the definitions. The graph of a function f is a collection of ordered pairs x comma f of x, such that x is in the domain of f. The x-intercepts of a function y equals f of x are the x values for which f of x equals 0. Another term used to represent zeros are roots, solutions, and zeros of a function. And we discussed this in the previous sections. So this is kind of a review of what we've been doing um, in the last four sections. Use the graph of the function to find the following. First, does the graph represent y as a function of x? So we can use a vertical line test. And so if I draw a line anywhere on my graph, I can see that it crosses in one point. So I would say that this is a function since it passes the vertical line test. Find the domain and the range <clears throat> of f. So the domain, again, are all the x values that are being used by this graph. So you can see that we start at negative 4. But we have an open circle, so that means that for negative 4, actually this is 1, 2, 3. For negative 3, we're going to use a parenthesis because the point is not included. And then if we keep going across the x-axis, these points are being used all the way until we get to this x, which is 1, 2. If you notice at x equals 2, we are still part of the graph. And at x equals 2, we have a closed dot, so we use a bracket. The 5, for example, if we go up or down, doesn't touch the graph, so these numbers after 2 are not part of the domain. The range, we're looking at the y values, so all these y values here. So the smallest y value that is part of the graph is at 1, 2, 3, negative 4. So we use bracket negative 4, bracket because that point is included. And if we keep going up on the y-axis, we get to 5. 5 is also included. So we use a bracket for that. Find f of negative 1. So here, your x is negative 1. And we're trying to find out what y is at, negative, at x equals negative 1. So here's my negative 1. So I go up or down until I get to the graph. So if I go down, it touches the graph at this point, And that y value is 1, 2, 3, 4. So f of negative 1 is equal to negative 4. At f of 0, x is 0, I go down. And it touches the graph at negative 3. And at x equals negative 3, which is right here, it touches at 0, but notice what we have an open circle. So we say this is undefined. And then f of 2 is here. If I go up to the graph, then I see that my y is 5. Find the zeros of f. Remember, the zeros are the x-intercepts. And all that means is where is the graph crossing the x-axis? So the x-axis is right here and the graph is crossing at this point so we say that the zero is at x equals one and then here although this is touching it looks like it's touching the x-axis since it's an open circle it's not touching that um point the roots is just another name for zeros and solutions is another name for zeros so these are all the same um point just different names for it so let's look at number example two or letter b does the graph represent y as a function if we draw a vertical line it's going to pass a test even if we draw a vertical line here this point is not included so this would be yes it is a function find the domain so here we want to ask um, what are the x values that are being used. I'm going to go ahead and put an arrow to represent these lines going extending um, to infinity. So for the domain, notice that all of these x's are being used. 
Okay, and this is going to go on to um, a negative infinity. So we start with negative infinity. And then we keep going across and you can see that all of these X's are being used because they land on top of the graph at some point. And it's also going to go to infinity. So again, the domain is all the X values that are being used. And then the range, we're going to look at the Y values. So all of these values here. So if I pick any number here, I'm always going to fall on a graph on the line. So those, all these values are being used. And up to here, these values are being used. But notice that past two, if I was to go across, there's no graph. So my range is going to go from negative infinity. And then it's going to go up to two, because that's the highest y value that's being used. And the two is an open circle, so I need a parenthesis. So f of negative two is going to be f of negative 2 is going to be at negative 2 for x, we go down, and the graph touches negative 2. f of 0 f of 0 is right here, and so the y value is 0. f of 1, and we go up, it gives you two options, but again, this one is not included. So f of 1 is going to be 1. And then f of 3, if we go up, we're going to get 1. Find the zeros. Again, the zeros is where the x-axis, um, the graph crosses the x-axis. So that's going to be at this point. So at 0. Okay, so now we're going to look at another example. Example three. Does a graph represent y as a function? Let me go ahead and add my arrows here. So if I use a vertical line test, then it does. So I'm going to say yes. Find the function values of f of four. So here we have one, two, three, four. So we get zero. So I'm going to write B here. So F of 4 is equal to 0. And F of 1, if I go down, gives me negative 3. That was letter B. Letter C, find the domain. So what X values are being used? If you notice here, no matter what X I pick, I'm always going to be able to get on the graph. This extends forever. So I'm going to be able to get on the graph. So my domain will go from negative infinity to positive infinity. And my range, the lowest value here, the smallest value, is at this point, which is negative 4. And it's going to go up from negative 4 to infinity. Find the zeros of f. Those are the Numbers where the graph crosses the x-axis, so this one has two. Um, one is here, and one is here. So at x equals zero, we have a zero, and at x equals four, we have a zero. f of x is equal to negative four. So here, instead of giving me the number that represents x, they're, ask, they're giving us the number that represents y. So when y is negative four, they want to know what is x. So here's my y, and that x value is going to be 2. Okay, so example 4, find the zeros of each function for each graph. So here again, the zeros is where the graph crosses the x-axis. So we say that the zeros are x equals negative 2, this point here and x equals 5 thirds. On this one, we have a 0 here and a 0 here. So this is going to be x is equal to square root of 10, and x is equal to negative square root of 10. And the last one here, 
my zeros. So my graph crosses at this point. So that x value is um, 3 halves. So if we don't have a graph, we still need to be able to find it algebraically. So one of the things that we can see from the graphs is that your x, your zeros, the y value is always zero. Okay, so that's going to be our first step. Find the zeros of the functions algebraically. The first step is to make the y, set it equal to zero. And then we're going to solve for x. So we subtract 18, divide by 3. So x is equal to negative 6. Letter b, we let y equal 0. In order to um, solve for x here, we need to square both sides. The square root and the square become 1, or we say they cancel. So we get 3x plus 2 is equal to 0. Subtract 2 and divide by 3. Okay, so we go to letter C. We let x equal, uh, y equal 0. Multiply um, 2x squared minus 6 on both sides. So this becomes 1. 2x squared minus 6 times 0 is 0. Subtract the 3. So x is equal to negative 3. Letter D. So here we let um, y equal 0. And then we want to factor out um, what they have in common. So if you notice here, we have um, 81 and 9. So what they have in common is um, 9. They both have factors of 9. And how do I determine that? Uh, for example, the factors of 9 are 1 times 9 and 3 times 3. The factors of 81 is 1 and 81. 3 and 27 and 9 times 9. So you can see that the greatest common factor that they have in common is 9. Okay, So I can factor out a 9. And then for x fourth and x squared, the greatest common factor for those would be x squared, because there's an x squared here and there's an x squared here. So in order to get 81, I would have to multiply 9 times 9. Let's make that a negative. So 9 times negative 9 is negative 81. And then x squared times x squared would be this x squared to the fourth. And here to get this 9, we just need to multiply by 1. 9x squared times 1 is 9x squared. So I have two factors. So I can set each one equal to 0. So in here, if I divide by 9, I get 0 is equal to x squared. Take the square root on both sides, so that gives me x is equal to 0. And for this one, I'm going to write it over here. If I subtract 1, then I get negative 1 is equal to negative 9x squared. Divide by negative 9. x squared is equal to positive 1 9 take the square root, so x is equal to plus or minus one-third. So the zeros for this one, I'm going to write them here, are x equals zero, x equals one-third, and x equals negative one-third. In chapter two, we'll be working more with these type of problems that are quadratic.
So in this pro problem, we let um, h of x equal 0. Notice that they all have at least one x. So I can factor out an x. Taking out an x out of here would give me x squared. Plus taking one out of here would give me plus 5x. And taking this one out here would give me a 6. We need to um, factor x squared plus 5x plus 6. And that becomes x plus 3 times x plus 2. And then we can set each factor equal to 0. So x is negative 2, x is negative 3, and x is equal to 0. Don't worry too much for this chapter on um, factoring this. We will look at this in chapter 2 in more detail. As the same for letter D. The ones you want to be more um, familiar with right now would be A, B, C, and E. So for E, we let this equal to 0. Subtract the 20. Divide by 4. So X would be negative 5. So this is how we would find the zeros um, algebraically. The next part of this um, section, I want to show you a quick video. So in that video, we saw some roller coasters. And in math, in order to make roller coasters, there's a lot of physics involved, but also a lot of math. And so we're going to start talking about some of these characteristics. And so a function f is increasing on an interval when for any x1 and x2 in the interval, x1 is less than x2 implies that f of x1 is less than f of x2. Again, these are just the y values. And so basically, if we are going from left to right, you can see that the graph is increasing from this point all the way to this point. So from the interval 2, 4, the graph is increasing. You always want to look at the x-axis to determine that interval. So we can see that from here, from here to here, the graph is increasing. The graph is decreasing on an interval when x1 and x2, if x1 is less than x2, implies that f of x1 is greater than f of x2. And so you can see from this interval here, from negative 2 to 0, the graph is decreasing. So from left to right, this is going down. And then a graph is going to be constant for when x1 and x2, if x1 is greater than x2, implies that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. And you can see um, from this interval to from this point to this point, the graph is constant. And then we say that a function value f of a is a relative minimum 
of f when there exists an interval x1, x2 that contains a such that x1 is less than x and less than x2 implies f of a is less than or equal to f of x. And then we have the, the function value f of a is relative maximum if we have a such that x1 is less than or equal to less than x and x is less than x2 implies f of a is greater than or equal to f of x. So basically what that means, if the graph is changing from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, at that point where the graph changes, we can find a relative minimum and or a relative maximum. So in this example here, the graph is decreasing, then it changes to increasing. So we find this relative minimum and then it goes from increasing to decreasing and we'll find that relative maximum. Identify next to the arrows whether the graph is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Then identify if there exists a relative maximum or relative min. So we go from left to right. This graph is increasing at this point. So from here all the way to here, the graph is increasing. Then the graph starts to decrease. So the graph here is decreasing. And that starts from this point here all the way to this point. And then from this point on, the graph starts to increase. Okay. And so what we're going to be interested in um, finding are the intervals where that happens. So we have increasing, decreasing, or constant. So for increasing, it's this green part here. And so the interval, notice that we have an arrow. So this is going to go forever. So this is going to be from negative infinity all the way to negative 2. And that's where the graph is increasing. So if we look anywhere in this interval, this graph is increasing. Then the graph starts to decrease from negative two, so the graph is decreasing here, all the way to positive two. So again, in the x, to get the intervals, we're looking at the x values. So from here to here, you can see that the graph is decreasing, okay? And then we go from here on, the graph is increasing, so this point is from two to infinity and there was no um, constant places. So let's look at number 29. It says determine the open intervals on which the function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Find the relative maximum or minimum. So, we're going to be interested in getting the increasing intervals, decreasing intervals, and if there's any constant, constant part. So um, if we go from left to right, you notice the arrow. So that means that we're going to be looking at all these values here. And it's decreasing until it gets to number one here. Okay. So from negative infinity to 1, the graph is decreasing. Then from this 1 right here, the graph is increasing up to this point. So what I have in red here, that's your interval for increasing. So from 1 to 3. And we always use parentheses um, for the intervals. We don't have to worry about the brackets. Then we go from 3 all the way to 4 up to here. And the point here is decreasing. So from 3 to 4, the graph is decreasing. 
and then from four to infinity, like all these points here, the graph is gonna be increasing. So from four to infinity. And then there was no constant um, part of the graph. Then we need to find um, the minimum and the maximum. So we're gonna have a relative minima and a relative maxima. And so these occur anytime that you change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So here the graph was decreasing, then it went to increasing. So at this point here, we have a relative minimum. And the way we write that is x is equal to 1. So at x equals 1, we have a relative minimum. And then it goes from increasing to decreasing. So at this point, we have a relative maximum. And then we go back down. So at this point, that creates a relative minimum at x equals um, 4. So we are looking at this interval here. That's the highest point. So that's why it's a maximum. And then this interval is the lowest point of that interval. So that's a minimum. OK, so let's look at the next one. We have increasing. And then we're looking for decreasing. And then we're looking for constant. So if you notice, the arrow represented goes on forever. So that means that we're going to be looking at these values here. And this graph is decreasing. It's falling down up to this point. So up to this point, it decreases. So that's negative 1. So from negative infinity to negative 1, the graph is decreasing. Then from negative 1, from negative 1 right here, all the way to positive 1, the graph is increasing. And then the graph starts to decrease again from 1. And then it's going to go to infinity. There's none constant. For constant, there's none. Since you have increasing to decreasing, then that creates minimums or maximums. So let's write relative minima and relative maxima. So here, this is where my graph changed. So you can see that it's a relative minimum at x equals uh, 1, negative 1. And then here the graph changes again. So that's going to be a relative maximum at x equals 1. OK, letter C. So I'm going to go ahead and add arrows here. So increasing and decreasing. So here we can see that the graph is decreasing, and that's going to go from negative infinity all the way to this point, which is negative 5. So all of this right here is your decreasing part. And then the graph starts to increase from here all the way to this point, which is negative Two. So from negative 5 to negative 2, the graph is increasing. So that's this interval here. So from here to here, this graph is increasing. And then from negative 5 to 0, you can see that the graph starts to decrease again. So negative 5 to 0, that's from here. Sorry, not negative 5. Negative 2 to 0, the graph starts to decrease. And then from 0 to positive 2, the graph increases again. So from here to here, the graph increases. 
and then the graph starts to decrease again. So from zero, from two, all the way to this point, the graph starts to decrease. So that point is from two, three, four, to five. And then from five on, the graph is increasing. So from five to infinity, the graph is increasing. Relative minima, relative maxima. So at this point here, that's where the graph changes from increasing, decreasing to increasing. And so at this point, there is a relative minimum. And that's at x equals 5, negative 5. And then at x equals negative 2, that's a relative maximum. Then we have a relative min at x equals 0 right here. And then a relative maximum at x equals 2. And a relative maximum minimum at x equals 5. Okay, the next one, we can see that the graph is constant. So from here to here, it's constant. From here to here, it's constant and constant. So we can say from negative 2 right here all the way to 0. And then from 0 to 2 and from 2 to 4, the graph is constant. Since there was no increasing to decreasing or vice versa, then there's no minimums and no maximums. Okay, the next one. So we have increasing or decreasing. So from here, the graph, if we go from left to right, it's decreasing. So this number here is negative 4. And it's decreasing all the way to the number negative 2. So we're going to have from negative 4 to negative 2. And then from negative 2, it starts to increase all the way to this point. And so that's going to go from negative 2 to 3. So from here to here, the graph is increasing. There's no constant part. And so the graph here went from decreasing to increasing, so it creates a relative minima at x equals negative 2. On this next one, let's go ahead and put arrows here. And so the graph So from this point here to here, if we go from left to right, the graph is increasing from here to here. So that's negative infinity to zero. And then it's going to be constant from zero to two. So there's none for decreasing. And then it's constant from zero to two. There was no increase to decrease or decrease to increase. So there is no relative min or no relative maximum. So here we have from this point to this point right here, the graph is from left to right increasing. So all of this. The graph is increasing from negative infinity to negative 2. So in this interval here, you can see that the graph is increasing. And then from this point all the way to this point, which is at x equals 0, the graph is decreasing. So from negative 2 to 0, the graph is decreasing. And then from 0 to infinity, 
the graph is increasing again. Since we went from increasing to decreasing, then that creates some relative mins and max. So the minima is here at x equals zero. And then there's a relative maxima at x equals negative two. Okay, so the next example from this point to this point, the graph is decreasing and that's negative three to negative one. And then from negative one to this point, the graph is increasing and that's from negative one Two, two, and then there's a relative minimum at x equals negative one. So the last part of this video is determining when a function is even or odd. So a function y equals f of x is even when for each x in the domain of f, we get f of negative x is equal to f of x. And it's going to be odd when we let x equals negative and we get negative f of x. Okay. So to determine whether each of the following is even or odd or neither, then the first thing we want to do is to plug in a negative for x. And so if I plug in negative for x here and simplify, we get x squared plus 6. So f of negative x, if you notice, gives me the same result as my original equation. So if these are the same, then we say that the function is even. And if a function is even, it's going to have y-axis symmetry. So you can use the test for y-axis symmetry if you like that we learn in the other sections, or you can use the following procedure. So let's look at the next one. So to figure out if it's even or odd, we let x be negative. And then we simplify. Negative x cubed would be negative, And negative negative is positive. So you want to ask yourself, is my result the same as my original? So my original was 7x cubed minus x, and I ended up with negative 7x cubed plus x. So these are not the same. Okay. So if these are not the same, then all it tells me is that it's not even. So now we need to check for odd. To check for odd, what we're going to do is uh, factor out a negative. So if I take out a negative from here, then I'm left with a positive 7x cubed. And if I take a negative out of this x, I'll be left with a negative x. So negative 7x cubed and negative times negative is a positive x. So basically, we're writing a negative in front and changing the signs for these. So this was negative, now it's positive. That was positive, now it's negative. Now you wanna compare. Does this give you the same as this result? So in the parentheses, we have seven x cubed minus x, seven x cubed minus x. So the definition tells us that 
if we end up with the same thing, f of x right here, with a negative in front, then it's going to be odd. So this is the same f of x with a negative in front. So that's going to tell me that it's odd. So this function is odd. When it's odd, then it has symmetry in the origin. Okay, so let's look at h of x. So we replace it with a negative. Negative x to the fifth would be negative x fifth plus one. This does not give me the same result as my original. So that tells me that it's not even. So we check for odd. So to check for odd, we factor out this negative in front, change the signs for this. So um, this will become x to the fifth, change the sign for this, that would become negative one. So then we get, you wanna compare, you wanna compare if this in here is the same as your original, and you can see that it's not. So since they're not the same, then we say that this is not odd. So this is not odd. So let's try the next one. So in this case, we say it's neither. So if we plug in a negative for x, and simplify, then we get five minus three times negative x, is positive 3x. And so again, these are not the same. So we say that it's not even. To check for odd, we factor a negative out in front, change the sign so 5 is negative 5, 3x would be negative 3x. So we want to check if this is the same as the original. And you can see that it's not, so we say this is not odd. And so the answer here is that it's neither. Go ahead and try letter E for a second. So we plug in the negative. Negative x to the fourth would be positive x to the fourth. Negative x squared would be positive. Then we have a minus sign here, minus one. So you can see that the, this is the same. So this is going to be even. Once you determine that it's even, then we don't need to check that it's odd. OK, letter G or letter E, we let x equals negative. So negative x cubed is going to be negative minus 3x. So these are not the same, not the same. So this is not even. So we check for um, odd by factoring out a negative, change my signs here. So that's two X cubed and a three X. So we compare the inside two X cubed plus three X. Is it the same as this? And you can see that it is the same as the original. This is the original. We get the same with the negative. So that tells us that this function is odd. So there is um, a shortcut to all of this. And it has to do with the exponents. Okay. So if you notice here, my exponent here is 3 and my exponent here is a 1. Since they're both odd, it made it odd. If you have a combination, here's another one. 
we have a three and a one, so that they're both odd, so the function's gonna be odd. If you have a combination of odd and even, then it's it's gonna be neither. If it's all evens, then it's gonna be even. The tricky part comes with comes when we have, for example, A, C, or D. Okay. So what happens here is the exponent for six. Notice six doesn't have a variable, but in reality. This is the same as x squared plus 6 is the same as x squared plus 6x to the 0. x to the 0 is just 1. That's why we just write it as 6. So we never write x to the 0, but it is there. So if we look at these exponents, this is even, and 0 is considered to be even. So since they're both even, then that makes the whole problem even function okay but if you look at letter c x to the fifth plus one that's the same as x to the fifth plus one x to the zero well here you have odd for five and then zero is considered even so since you have an odd and an even then that's why this function became neither Same here, the x here is a one, but the five has an x to the zero, which is gonna be um, neither again. So let me give you some more examples for that. Let me get a paper. So for example, x squared plus x plus 4, and we want to know if this is even or odd. Well, the 2 is even, and this has a 1, so that's odd. Since there is a combination of both, then we say neither. Here, the 4 is even and the 2 is even. So we're looking at the exponents. Since they're both even, then this whole thing is even. Okay, here we're looking at the 7, the 5, and this has a 1, so they're all odd. So that makes the whole function odd. So this one here, you have odd and even, so that's going to be neither. Okay. So here we have a 6, a 4, and a 2. And then this 3 here, remember, has this imaginary x to the 0 that we don't write. So then the 0 is also considered even. So we have even, 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 even. So that's going to be even. So here we have odd. The one here is odd. And then again here we have this x to the 0. So the 0 is even. So you have even, odd, odd. So this is going to be neither. Okay. So again, when they're all even, then the whole function is even. If they're all odd, like this one, 7, 5, and 1, then it's odd. If it has a constant with all even, then it's going to be even. But if you have a constant that has odd in it, then it's going to be neither.
determine whether each of the following functions is even, odd, or neither. So in the last sections, we looked at um, symmetry. So this has symmetry on the y-axis. So if it has symmetry on the y-axis, then it makes the graph even. So this would be even because it has symmetry on the y-axis. And then this one has symmetry on the origin. Since it has symmetry in the origin, then the function is going to be odd.